and welcome to this psychology CPD webinar looking at great ways to teach forensic psychology, particularly looking at the AQA specification, uh, but should be useful if you're from other, other specs as well. Uh, we'll start by looking at the specification in detail, looking at the old spec versus the new spec. Uh, we'll look at the possible essay questions that can come up, of which there's around 19 potentials that I've highlighted, and then we'll look out for some areas that you might need to watch out for. In the second half of the webinar, we'll look at great ways that you can teach forensic psychology, and I've got some introductory lessons for you, a uh, lesson on offender profiling, and then iSync's personality questionnaire, and looking at an activity around signposting for evaluation purposes. So let's start by looking at the specification, just compare the old versus the new spec and what, what might be different, okay? So I put the old spec at the top of the screen there uh, and then the new spec at the bottom of the screen. And, and really there's a few little changes, but actually if anything, AQA's just become a bit more specific in the new spec. So if we just go through a few of them, what you'll find is in terms of offender profiling, they've just highlighted some really particular key terms that you need to be aware of. So top down, organized versus disorganized, bottom up including investigative psychology and geographical profiling as well. In terms of the biological explanations, they now explicitly state genes and neural explanations, and the psychological explanations actually name levels of moral reasoning and cognitive distortions, as well as the behaviourist theory of differential association theory. And then, uh, last but not least, we've got a dealing with uh, offenders now includes psychological effects on custodial sentencing and restorative justice programmes. So those are the kind of the key summary changes, okay? Um, so in terms of the spec, I'll just highlight the whole thing on screen now so you can just see an overview of it. It's quite a large uh, part of the specification, but a really, really interesting unit for students. What I've also done for you, as always, is I've just provided a mapping of where the different sample questions for sample papers 1, 2 and 3 uh, occur. And there are some essay questions in there. For example, there is discuss the psychological effects of custodial sentences and discuss biological explanations of offending behaviour. Just so you can see where AQA and the type of questions that AQA put and where AQA actually distributed the questions across the sample papers. Okay, uh, Just for your own benefit so you know what types of questions could and couldn't come up. Um, as I mentioned, there are 19 potential essay questions uh, in this topic, so it is a, is a big, big topic. Okay, uh, And what I've done is drawn those from the different sample assessment materials, Exam Pro and the various different, uh, various different textbooks that are out there. And, and the two areas that jump out at me are being particularly large are the psychological explanations and dealing with offender behaviour, which actually have five essay topics or questions in psychological explanations, which is quite large. And then even larger, ways of dealing with offender profile has seven different types of questions that could come up. So we really, really need to watch out for those topics. They're big areas and we therefore need to devote the, the right amount of time to teaching them. What's great though is as a, uh, as a course or as a topic that has been taught previously, we can actually learn a lot of information from the examiner commentary. Uh, so there's some areas that I just want to pick out where we can pick up on the typical mistakes uh, that students have made in the past when looking at different essay questions. So if we start by looking at this one, so discuss Einstein's theory of criminal personality and refer to evidence in your answer. Now I've broken this down into what the examiners say in terms of AO1 and AO3. Uh, so firstly, the examiner said that many students knew little about Einstein's theory as it relates to offending. Uh, and the key there is as it relates to offending. Students know the knowledge when it comes to Einstein's personality questionnaire, but they don't know what traits are associated with criminal personality. The examiner goes on to say a substantial number of students could not even identify criminal personality as someone who has high levels of extroversion and neuroticism. Okay, So there's a real key, obviously, when teaching this topic, that students, even if you run the questionnaire in class, which is a nice thing to do, make sure students know exactly how the questionnaire and the theory relates to offending. Now, in terms of the evaluation, uh, discussions were generally very weak, mostly focused on the problems of the questionnaire itself, so the EPI, with no link to criminal personality. Okay. And then last but not least, knowledge of the inherited aspects of personality and links to the nervous system were very, very rare. So what's really interesting, and this is why I tend to start my planning with examiner commentary and then work backwards through mark schemes and then go to the textbooks, is that you can already get a sense of where students are likely to trip up when you're teaching this topic. They might understand the questionnaire and I sense theory of personality, but they really need to explicitly know how that relates to offending behaviour. If we really want to push our students, they really need to know how it relates to offending behaviour and the links that I sent made to the nervous system, which were really rare. So that's the biological aspect which students need to be aware of. Okay, So it's all about applying our knowledge actually to the theory of criminal personality. 
In terms of a second question, so if we take a look at this one now, so describe and evaluate anger management as a treatment for offending and refer to evidence in your answer. There were some AO3 points in particular that examiners commented on that evaluations were generally weaker and students just listed their evaluation points and in some cases it was uh, evidence from the evaluation was just missing altogether um, and therefore was so vague it was un not very credit worthy. So students even if they're making these generic evaluation points still need to try and include evidence or examples within them to make them effective points. Okay, So something to watch out for in that particular topic, anger management. The third topic, and these are trickier essays, outline and compare two explanations of offending and refer to evidence in your, your, your answer. Uh, you could probably already guess what the issue is going to be with this one. And actually it was that word compare that really threw students. Um, the examiner said in terms of the comparison or discussion, little effective comparisons were made. And usually each explanation was just evaluated separately in turn. Okay, So they actually outlined two explanations of offending, evaluated them separately, but made no links to comparison. As a consequence of this, many students who ought to have done better were limited to a maximum of six marks, and that would have been six in the old specification, so actually it would be even fewer in the, in the new specification. So there you have it. I think it's always a really interesting starting point just to look at the old specifications, the old essay questions and the old examiner's reports to work out where have students historically struggled. And you've got those three areas. So if you can keep those sort of in the, in the back of your mind when teaching, hopefully that will help you to avoid sort of tripping over those errors uh, and those issues when teaching this time round. So that's it for the specification. We're going to move on to now uh, some interesting ways to sort of introduce uh, and teach forensic psychology and really just want to provide you with some nice food for thought here. Uh, before we begin the actual lessons themselves, a couple of websites that you might like to try out. Um, really nice one for sort of talking about geographical uh, profiling although not 100% relevant just an interesting discussion you can go onto a website www.maps.met.police.uk and that website provides you with uh, the crime statistics and rates in your area uh, I live uh, by the station uh, on this map which is in this orange area which means it's high crime uh, if you go to the other side of the tracks over here it goes blue which is very little crime so I'm obviously on the wrong side of the fence for that one uh, and a great, great uh, website which can be used for this topic and for aggression really nicely, a website called pimp, pimptheface.com where you can get people to create their own sort of faces and you could ask them as a really nice homework task uh, to sort of create a face of what a criminal might look like to see if actually uh, they create the features that you might expect if you're replying that to sort of uh, Lombasso's theory, etc. Et okay, so a really nice homework task you could put in there. Uh, and centred around that, you've got a whole discussion that you can have in terms of actually do the features they've uh, mapped out really apply to the features that we'd expect of the atavistic form as uh, so a sloping brow, pronounced jaw, uh, high cheekbones, etc. Okay, now on to the, uh, the actual activities that you might want to use and embed into your lessons and hopefully some that will just give you a bit of food for thought and uh, maybe something of use to. Uh, the first one I've called the changing nature of crime, uh, which the name kind of gives it away. And the aim of this particular activity is for students to consider the problems with defining crime, which is of course part of the specification, and how crime changes, whether it's culturally or historically, okay? Now the way the activity works is you provide your students with a series of sort of statements and you can either get them to do this in groups or give them them individually for a discussion point. And what you then want them to do is to consider actually are there any issues with these sort of examples in terms of culture, in terms of time, in, ter in terms of the person's age? So if we look at uh, the second one on screen there, so in Arizona in the US it's actually illegal to carry a handgun in public uh, without any form of registration license or certificate. Uh, whereas of course in the UK it's uh, an offence to even possess a firearm without a certificate. So obviously we've got that cultural difference there which is particularly interesting. Um, if we look at the top example, uh, before 1967, homosexual acts in the UK were illegal. Uh, and then in 1967, the uh, Sexual Offences Act decriminalised homosexuality uh, or homosexual acts between men in private uh, who were at least 21 years old. OK, um, and then they decriminalised uh, marriage even later. And that's so you can see actually how culture and time uh, has changed uh, for, for that particular scenario. So really nice sort of discussion activity. On to the second activity, uh, I think students often, or I find that students, it often helps them to produce things in sort of a flow chart if they've got to remember a series of steps or a series of stages. So the second activity, which is just called top-down flow chart, is really to get students to create a diagram of the top-down approach to offender profiling, okay? Uh, two different ways, of course, you could do this. You could either do it as a nice sort of sorting activity or, or as a more simple sort of labelling activity, depends on what you've got the time for. So if you wanted to cut them out, I provided you with a handout where you could do that quite easily. 
Um, if you're going to do that, I suggest doing it on A3 because there's quite a lot of information for this one and you'd probably want your students to work in groups. If you go down that route, I've also provided you with a slide here where just where the information comes up as well, just so your students can see how you might construct uh, the flow chart of top-down profiling. Okay, uh, So you can borrow that slide if you wish. If you decide to go for a labelling task, you'd simply provide them with the labels on a slide and see if they can put it back into the flow chart and do it that way. Okay, on to activity three uh, for bottom-up profiling. Um, I've suggested doing this one as a bit of a sort of flipped learning exercise. The nice thing about forensic psychology is there's a huge number of interesting documentaries uh, and opportunities to use flipped learning. Um, and so the way I've provided this one is there's a really structured handout that you can give to your students before the lesson because some of the do documentaries, um, although they're really interesting, are also quite long. So whether you'd want to spend 20 minutes in a lesson watching a documentary is questionable depending upon your lesson time. Okay, So I, I produced this activity as really a sort of flipped learning exercise. And the way it works is the handout provides links to two key documentaries. You've got a documentary by David Cantor uh, called Following in the Killer's Footsteps which is 36 minutes long so quite a long documentary but a really really interesting one. Um, you've then got a hot, another documentary on the Railway Rapist serial killer documentary which is even longer it's a 46 minute one so you could ask your students to maybe select one or two if they're, if they're up for watching two of those documentaries to watch them both, both interesting and well worth a watch. The idea is that the activity then gives them some information on the bottom-up approach and geographical profiling and the idea is that the students then consider a series of questions and there's five of them there uh, before they come to the next lesson ready to sort of discuss those questions or you could even ask them to answer them all and peer assess them in the following lesson. It's entirely up to you but the questions require that they've actually watched those videos so it should be a, a good telling point that you know your students have actually done the work before the lesson. So it should be a nice activity if you want to experiment with some flipped learning uh, in this term. Fourth activity, I've called the EPQ and signposting. Um, I'm sure you have a copy of this, but we produced our own version of it, which we've just 20 questions. Uh, the aim of this activity is to get students to complete the uh, ISEX personality questionnaire uh, and consider the validity and the reliability of assessing personality using a questionnaire, and then more importantly, applying it really to criminal uh, behaviour, which is obviously the key point that the examiner reports drew out earlier that many students miss this. Okay. Now, as you'll see on the handout, there is the scoring as well, so students can score their own questionnaire, and then a series of questions for them to consider in relation to criminal personality. Okay. Uh, the questions are just on screen here. So do you think it's possible to measure personality using a questionnaire? Do you think that your personality remains consistent over time? Nice question to ask them there. Are there any issues with measuring personality via a questionnaire and applying that? Uh, to criminal behaviour uh, and how could we assess the reliability of this questionnaire. So that's the first part which is why we call this 4A. So getting them to actually complete the EPQ. The second part of the activity which is probably the more important part is part on signposting, okay? uh, a technique called signposting and the aim of this really helps to ensure that students uh, will tailor the, any evaluation points they, they write back to the question. So if we imagine that the question was this one to so discuss Einstein's theory of criminal personality what we want students to do is really make sure that any evaluative commentary they write actually is linked to that question and not just a generic point because examiners hate that. Um, so I'll give you an example on the screen here. You, you could use as a point there is an unclear relationship between the personality traits and offending behaviour. And it may be that uh, the type of crime is actually a more reliable predictor of whether a person is extrovert or introvert. We could bring in some evidence, uh, so for, for example, extroverts might seek out environmental stimulation. Uh, criminals who happen to be extrovert might commit crimes that raise adrenaline levels such as joyriding, physical assault. And then we say, well, this is important because it may be that extroversion doesn't relate to criminality at all, but it's actually just a distinguishing factor of the type of crime committed. So that's a good evaluation point, but what it's not done is really linked the answer back, or it's not signposted the answer really back to the question. So if we was to redo that evaluation point, and that's the purpose of this task for students, is to get them to really make sure they're using the question wording in any evaluation points they write so that you know that their answer is, is signposted back to the question. Okay. So if we was to reread that again, so you'll see I put there that there's an unclear relationship between all three personality traits and offending behaviour. For example, extroversion not consistently found to relate to criminality. So I've actually got the criminality example in there. I've kept the evidence the same. For example, extroverts might seek out uh, 
environmental stimulation and criminals who happen to be extrovert might commit crimes that raise adrenaline and so forth. What I've changed though is at the bottom I've actually made sure that I've really really signposted to the examiner and said look I'm actually answering the question. So this is important because it may be that extroversion does not relate to criminality but is a distinguishing factor in the types of crime committed and therefore I think theory of criminal personality may be an invalid predictor of criminality or criminal behaviour. And you can see that's a much better evaluation point although the content's actually the same it's just a stylistic change in how we write the point. So there we have it. The aim is really just to help students ensure that they tailor their evaluation points back to the question. So there we have it. Hopefully sort of three or four different ways that you could teach different aspects of the course. Hope you found those useful may use some of those in your lesson. As always, all the resources are already available on the, uh, the tutor to website. So if you go to the Explore tab at the top of the Psychology page, then in Series and look out for the series that's called CPD Webinar Recordings, you can download all the resources free of charge from there. As I say, hopefully you find that useful. And please feel free to share those with your teaching colleagues. Uh, and as always, if you've got any questions or queries, please just either ask them via our social media channels, whether it's Twitter or Facebook, or get in touch with me directly, joseph at tutor2.net. Hope you found that useful and thank you for watching.